Malaria, we are coming for you. Twenty Eliud, keep on running at them. We have almost got them. We gotta keep going. Keep the pressure on. You take the middle, I'll attack. Day or night? There is nowhere to hide. To the right. We've got new moves. Class, we buy back. <laughs> Malaria, we see you. We know your game. We're taking control. Who's boss now? Malaria, you've met your match. Thank you, David Beckham. Today on the stream, tackling one of the world's oldest diseases. Every minute, a child dies from malaria, and we're going to bring you some personal stories, look at the work that's being done to save lives, and find out if it's possible to end the mosquito-borne illness in our lifetime. If you're watching on YouTube, you can join the conversation via the comments section. You can ask our experts anything about malaria. We start with film director Medya Labi, who directed the Draw the Line Against Malaria campaign video that you just saw at the very beginning of the show, and explorer and mountaineer, Sarah Kumalo. It is so good to have you. Um, Medji and Sarah, I have travelled all over the African continent, and there have been times where I've been talking to a, a guest or waiting for an interview, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a bit late. I've got a little bit of a malaria, or I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. I've got a little bit of malaria. It is not taken entirely seriously, Sarah. I'm just going to share this with our audience, uh, where you talk about, on, on Instagram, you talk about being so proud to be a zero malaria ambassador, that we can beat malaria. I have suffered from malaria countless times, and I know that with the right resources and leadership, we will win this fight. I have never had malaria, Sarah. What is it like? Share your experience. Oh, wow. I grew up in a... First of all, thank you for having me. I grew up in a malaria-infected area. Um, I, I had malaria countless times. So you get feverish, you get cold, you warm, uh, headaches. Um, but one of the memorable experiences that I had with malaria is my younger sister getting cerebral malaria. I remember the adults in the house panicking and taking her to hospital, and it actually left a permanent... Um, almost the like disability on her face until her adulthood. So I know malaria can be devastating. She wasn't in school for almost six months oh of that goodness. year. Wow. Um, and, and I know the effect uh, of, uh, of malaria on children and women especially. Mm -hmm. When I got in touch with the malaria, zero malaria uh, team, I got excited to be part of it because it, it, they showed me that it is possible to end it in our lifetime. Right. And hence my excitement to be part of it and get involved involved because it's not only affecting children, it's affecting women who are the backbone of right. every society on the continent. So let me just bring Meji into the conversation. Meji, did you recognize that, that attitude about that? It's a little bit of malaria until something happened to you last year. Tell us the story. What happened to you? Oh, I mean, definitely. Again, thanks for having me as well. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of people take malaria for granted, you know, around the world, you know, Nigeria especially, and, you know, Ghana and just West Africa. And Africa in general, it's something that is... It's really common. Thing. People, yeah, it's People common. get malaria and they get over it. But, um, you know, yeah. for me, I hadn't had that growing up. So I caught it for the first time last year. Um, I took it from Ghana to L.A. And uh, I had a, you know, I was hospitalized for a couple of days in L.A., Reggie, can, um, you know, can I can I show? Was, was I'm going to show you in your in your hospital bed. I'm not I'm not going to play the sound because you're groaning. Um, so that's oh. that's unkind. So let's <laughs> come here. Come here to Instagram. This is this is. I love that e even though you were so sick, you Instagrammed yourself yeah. on your sick bed. We've got Jay Z playing in the background. Fruit you've hardly yeah. touched. <laughs> How were you feeling at this moment with malaria? Oh, uh, you know, I was seriously just thankful for life at that point yeah. because you know there was you know, a few days where I was feeling really, you know, I was quite isolated and just yeah. feeling at, at my worst. So um, I was just thankful. And, you know, again, knowing that so many people die and so mm. many children die, like one child every minute dies of, of malaria, is that, and to know That's that it's preventable. That's a stunning statistic, isn't it? Stunning. It's, it's yeah. incredible. So, yeah. you know, I just hope that we can continue working towards, you know, zero malaria. 
What I love about both of you is that you are part of a team of, of people who are advocating for we have to take malaria seriously and if we have the resources we can beat malaria. Um, Meji, uh, there's a whole draw the line against malaria campaign and you brought together so many well-known names. I'm going to share your space, your time, Meji and Sarah, with them because they, again, they emphasise why we need to beat malaria. Let's take a look. I'm obviously excited to be here today and you've had a personal experience with malaria. It was super rough and it kind of really made me appreciate what people are going through. You know, they say every 60 seconds a child dies from malaria and it's totally preventable. Malaria has affected every single person that I know. I qualified for the World Junior Championships in Jamaica in 2002 but I was not able to travel because of malaria. I had malaria. It was really, really hard. The fever keep on going for 24 hours for three days in a row. It was a really tough time. I've been on a global mission to end malaria after losing my cousin Kayemba. I just think that malaria is not something that people should have to die from. You know, with this film, I really want young people to be inspired and, you know, understand that they are the ones who can lead the change. It's all about you guys now. Let's go. Mm. Both Meji and Sarah are both nodding as they're watching their other co-team advocates talking about malaria. Uh, sorry, you are an explorer, you're a mountaineer. From the heights of your career, what are you able to bring to the movement? I think it's a voice. I suddenly found myself on the 16th of May 2019 with a voice and I've decided to use it for good. Mm -hmm. And what excites me about the possibility of ending malaria is the opportunity that Africa has. We have the youngest population in the world. How are we going to make sure that we set them up as leaders of yeah. tomorrow's world? And I think that eradicating malaria today gives them an optimal position to actually lead the world. So I'm excited to be part of this movement. I'm excited to lend a small voice to make it possible um, in a way. Mm. And Meji, you brought your talents as a director to malaria, the malaria campaign. Have a look here on my laptop. Let's, let's take a look at this. Who would dare to play footy with David Beckham? <laughs> You're actually doing pretty well. <laughs> Beyond getting these celebs to really advocate for BT Malaria, what did you get out of this film? What are you hoping that other people you, will get out of this film? Um, you know, I just hope that it, you know, it brings more awareness to, to malaria and to you know, the, the plight that people are going through and how we can all work towards you know, our generation, especially this mm -hmm. new young generation, work towards you know, ending malaria, um, we have the tools, um, you know, we have the voice, we have social media, you know, we have so many different outlets that we can, you know, spread the message. So, you know, with this film and, you know, with the voices of our other, you know, malaria ambassadors and champions, you know, all of us coming together and, you know, trying to amplify this message as much as possible, you know, so we can kill this deadly disease. Yeah, Reggie and Sarah, yeah. thank you so much. Sarah, go ahead. You have the last word. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I'm very passionate about what Mandela said. He said, the power is in your hands. Ah. Nobody's going to come to and rescue us. We each have a responsibility to end malaria. So every voice counts. And we can draw the line. And we can end malaria. And it's exciting right. to be part of that. So, so good spending time with you, Sarah and Maggie. Thank you for joining us on the stream. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's take a closer look at the science and issues behind eradicating malaria. As a global health strategist, the most incredible legacy that I can pass on to my children and grandchildren is not the what of malaria eradication, but the how of malaria eradication. Because that learning is equivalent to a library of solutions to fight hundreds of pandemics. Because malaria is not just a single disease. It is equivalent to hundreds of different scenarios of social, cultural, political, environmental, and economic injustice and inequalities. Why is it so difficult to end malaria? Dr. Andrea Bosman is director of the WHO's Global Malaria Program. And Dr. Faith Ozier is chair of the Malaria Immunology and Vaccinology Department at Imperial College London. They have answers. <laughs> Doctors, so good to see you. Um, Dr. Faith, first of all, I'm just going to remind people where across the world we still have prevalence in malaria. If you have a look on my laptop, 
Dr. Faith, you already know this, but for our audience. So we go from South America through the African continent and then all the way through to Papua New Guinea. And you can look at this area and you just go, oh, it's the tropics. What is so difficult, Dr. Faith, about just eradicating malaria? It used to be in, in more parts of the world, but now it is stuck in that band of the tropics, particularly in Africa. What's the problem? The problem, the problem, thank you for having me on your show. The problem in those in the tropics is really the climate. The climate is favorable and conducive to mosquitoes. And so um, it's difficult to eradicate malaria because the climate supports the mosquitoes that transmit the parasite. That's why it's still there. Dr. Andrea, when we talk about malaria and when we're trying to encourage people to take it seriously, we often use statistics about how many children die from malaria. What is it about young people and malaria that makes them so vulnerable? Yeah, the, the children, unfortunately, have not been exposed when they um, start to grow to this deadly parasite. And uh, they face, uh, unfortunately, also several other diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea, malnutrition, which are also very common in the place where there is malaria. So by getting uh, um, very early, many inoculations, sometimes mm. even tens uh, or 20 per night, uh, they uh, suffer and we lose a lot of children at very young age. Uh, this is very, really unacceptable because we have today the means to prevent death from malaria. Yeah. Dr. Faith and Dr. Andrea, we have a lot of people who are watching right now on YouTube who say that they've, they've had malaria. But I'm going to share with you a few other thoughts as well. Uh, Kashin Busha says that in Uganda, the illness has increased this season. Have you seen that, Dr. Faith? Are you seeing a, a bigger increase in malaria, more people being impacted? Um, yes, so what's, we've, what's happened is that uh, because of COVID, um, interventions have, uh, services have broken down and uh, the interventions for malaria control have been interrupted. And so, yes, uh, we have seen more deaths because of, uh, because of COVID and, uh, and malaria is going up. Um, and in fact, uh, malaria has been going up for a few years um, in the sense that um, although we have many control tools, the effect that they've had seems to have flattened out. And so malaria is still very much uh, a present problem. Dr. Andrea, uh, please go ahead. You go first and then I'm going to go to YouTube second because Joshua wants to say something to you. Go ahead, Dr. Andrea. Yeah. Unfortunately, not only the measures have been interrupted, people also had, were afraid to go to the health services. They were afraid to also be in contact with other COVID cases. And not only so the badness distribution, the medicine distributions were partly affected, but also people were afraid to go to the health services. And we have uh, still uh, more than half of the people which don't get uh, the essential bed nets that they need or they don't get a rapid test or an effective medicines when they are sick. And um, this is really uh, very, very bad because with less than one dollar, we can save a life in malaria. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm just going to bring in Joshua, Joshua here. Joshua talks about collaborative effort, that we need people to get together to talk about malaria and then to find resources. He also says that it involves educating everybody and also producing more mosquito nets. This feels like the, the, the malaria that I remember when I visited Nigeria when I was a little girl and I was with my grandma. She had this big bed of mosquito nets. Are we still at the mosquito net stage, Faith? Um, yes, uh, mosquito nets are still very good for uh, preventing, um, for reducing transmission. Um, they're impregnated. They've got um, some drug on the bed net so that when mosquitoes land on the bed net, they're zapped and, and they're, they're killed. Um, and they protect, uh, they protect children and they protect adults from malaria. So yes, uh, bed nets are still um, really important and should be used where possible. I'm thinking about COVID, and, and I know you talked about COVID and the impact it's had on the momentum that was have, being had for treating malaria. But there are two ways to look at COVID. COVID slowed down 
the way that we are tackling malaria, but it also gave us a template for how a huge region and the world can get together, find the resources if they want to, if they find an illness important enough and solve an issue very quickly. Faith, you start. Andrea, you pick up. Uh, I couldn't agree more. COVID taught us that people, we can come together as a global um, society and put in the resources required to solve an urgent problem. And, um, you know, developing a vaccine for malaria is not as simple um, as it is for COVID because the malaria, pa malaria parasite is much more complex. But with good funding and good resources and commitment, political will, um, funding, resources, it's possible. <laughs> this show is all about money. Uh, is it, Andrea, are we just yeah. talking about money? Did you just need to throw <laughs> money at the issue and then we eradicate malaria across the world? Yeah, I think the science has been really a big mover of the advance that we had with COVID. The study, the vaccine development has been extraordinary. The development of tests, the new medicines, and clearly the society as a whole seeing COVID as a major threat to the whole um, globe, which we don't have yet for malaria. Malaria still affects uh, a lot of children, children in the remote rural areas with, which don't have, unfortunately, a voice. Uh, the parents uh, live in uh, communities which are a little isolated, and they have less voice uh, than to make malaria as a big um, political commitment for, for the fight uh, globally. So th that that is something that uh, COVID has led the way, and, and clearly we should take some of the good lessons from the fight against COVID. So I know you mentioned the vaccine for malaria, which was the biggest news for malaria last year. I'm not sure that everybody saw that news, or it kind of was buried because we were so focused on COVID at the time. Here's a headline I want to share with you. Scientists hail historic malaria vaccine approval, but point to challenges ahead. Let's start with first unpacking this vaccine. What are we looking at? This is your life work here, Dr. Faith. So I'm going to put up on the screen so people will understand what it is that we're talking about. This new vaccine that was revealed last year. It is called... R-T-S-S, or Muscarix. Dr. Faith, did I say that right? Yes, you did. All right. Recommended for use for children from last year. And it provides about 30% reduction in severe malaria. So now that we've all understood vaccines so much better because of our pandemic, I look at 30% and say that's not really a vaccine, is it, Dr. Faith? Yes and no. Yes, because um, the other way one can look at it is to say that for every 10 people that have malaria, the vaccine will prevent severe illness in three. So is it worth saving those three? Mm. Absolutely. Mm. However, is it good enough? Would you like to save more? Yes. And so I think that we have to take the vaccine as it is, and um, it's going to have an impact when you think about the millions who have malaria, we will save hundreds of thousands by this vaccine. But should we um, stop working on it? No, we continue to try and improve it so that we can improve that efficacy to what we have for the COVID vaccines, 90% and over. Uh, Andrea, would you be able to explain how the vaccine works for us, please? The vaccine is um, helping the body to um, eliminate the blood forms of the parasites. And uh, it, um, um, it's called a leaky vaccine. It not, doesn't give a, a full protection, but it can reduce uh, the number of acute illness 
the number of uh, severe anemia, the number also of severe uh, forms, and therefore prevents deaths. It is currently being looked in three countries on a large scale, and uh, the potential is really to save tens of thousands of lives in Africa. It should be used with other methods that are working very well, like uh, access to diagnosis and treatment and use of insecticide-treated nets. So, Dr. Faith, I'm thinking about this vaccine that three out of ten people, it will really help reduce the seriousness of malaria. So it's a start. It will save lives. Is it being produced all over? Do you remember that I showed that, that part of the globe, all over the tropics, so everybody can access it right now? Because remember that I showed you that headline? There was a problem there. Is this one of the problems, the availability of the vaccine? This is absolutely one of the problems. Um, the, one of the challenges is who will manufacture the vaccine? Who will pay for the vaccine? Um, in Western countries, um, when there's an illness, for example, COVID, governments step up and they are prepared to pay for the vaccine. And so manufacturers are willing to put in the investment required to produce the vaccine. Unfortunately for malaria, this isn't the case. We mm. do not have guarantees of who will buy the vaccine. And this is where because, our African Dr. governments... Because, Dr. Faith, let's be, really let's be, let's be candid here. Up. Because why? Why do we not know who's uh, going to produce it? Why isn't it produced immediately? One child is dying every minute. Our African governments need to step up to, to pay for the vaccines. That's what needs to happen. Dr. Andrea, is this a conundrum that we're going to get stuck? I.e., we, we have a way of saving lives from malaria, but we don't have the money to produce the vaccine. That's unethical, surely. Yeah, at the moment, uh, Gavi, uh, which is one of the funding mechanisms to um, fund uh, the vaccine for many countries, have mobilized 160 million to allow the initial uh, production and uh, scale up of the vaccine. There is a plan already by end of the 2022 to extend the use of the vaccine in the three countries, which have been at the moment using that in only pilot areas. And progressively, the company is going to expand the production. But still, uh, we will have uh, probably from three to five years uh, a situation where the demand will be certainly much higher than nice. the available supplies. Right. Does that make you furious, Faith? Um, absolutely. I think um, we in Africa, we feel the pain of malaria, as we've seen in the program. Um, we are the ones that uh, suffer all the economic losses that malaria uh, brings. Mm. And here we have a potential solution and we're not able to roll it out. I oh. think it's uh, unacceptable. It's weird. It's like a, a bittersweet part of the program in that there is a way to save so many lives, but there isn't a way to get those resources yet. Do you remember we asked at the very beginning of the show, is it possible to eradicate malaria in our lifetimes? Dr. Faith, is it? Um, I'm a strong believer that it absolutely is. Um, it requires commitment, it requires resources, it requires determination. But uh, if you can imagine that people are soon booking holidays to go to the moon, um, how is it that we can't prevent children from, um, from, from dying from a mosquito bite, a, a mosquito-borne disease? Um, I think it's completely That's preventable. doable. It's preventable. Yes, it's Good point. Doable. Dr. Andrea, in our lifetimes, eradicate malaria, gone, nowhere existing in the world. Possible? Yeah, the vision is to have a world free of malaria. And while it's still difficult to put a date for this, I think there will be so much investment in transformative tools, in mobilizing resources, mobilizing the community, that that is going to be achievable. Mm -hmm. So good to have you, Dr. Andrea. So good to have you, Dr. Faith, Meji and Sarah as well, who kicked off the program. Your questions, your comments in the YouTube section.
as well. And be careful, don't keep getting malaria out there. I know, I see what you've been writing on the YouTube comments. Come here on my laptop because this is the call to action. If you are interested in malaria, how to eradicate it, how to stay safe and keep yourself safe as well, go to zeromalaria.org. That's zeromalaria.org. Thanks for your comments and questions. I really appreciate them. Have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you.